Hi, today we're going to bust a scam or we're going to demonstrate that the oil companies have been keeping a secret from everyone that would allow you to improve the efficiency of an internal combustion engine. What I'm talking about is these HHO kits that you can buy online or on eBay that use the electrical system of the car to break water into hydrogen and oxygen and then feed that hydrogen and oxygen mixture into the engine in order to improve its performance. They're tempting because they're not real expensive and they're relatively easy to install. The question is, do they work? Now, if you ask a physicist whether or not they would work, they would say, no, it's ridiculous. There's no such thing as a perpetual motion machine, and there is no thermodynamic principle that would allow them to work. Problem is, a normal internal combustion engine has an efficiency of about 35% of the burning of chemical energy. 65% is converted into heat. It's the hot exhaust. It's the reason you need a radiator or fins on the engine. The mechanical output from the engine has to be used to drive the alternator. Typical efficiencies of an alternator are about 70%. It's relatively low because an alternator bleeds off some of its output in order to energize the copper coils that produce the magnetic field. That electricity then has to be fed into the electrolytic cell to break up the water into hydrogen and oxygen. Now in large scale industrial setups where they use plat platinum or palladium electrodes and high pressures and high temperatures, they can reach efficiencies between about 70 and 75%. The typical uh, HHO generators that you're gonna see in a car are not gonna be that efficient. And then what happens is the hydrogen and oxygen that comes out then has to be burned in the engine at about 35% efficiency. So if you take 100 units of mechanical output and convert that by 70% efficiency to electricity and then use that electricity at 70% to produce hydrogen and oxygen and then burn that at about 35% efficiency in the engine, you're going to get about 15 units of mechanical energy back. It can't work. It's busted. It's just... There's no reason to do it. However, there is a potential pathway where this might work. And that's why we built this whole setup to do this test. Because this is not just a failed perpetual motion machine. The bulk of the chemical energy that is going into this engine is coming from the fuel, the gasoline or the diesel. And so if you add a very flammable mixture, including oxygen, which is an excellent oxidizer, and hydrogen, which is a superb fuel, if that can enhance the combustion process even a little bit, that may be enough to compensate for the inefficiency of generating the additive. And that's what we're going to test. Now, the way an electrolytic cell works is pretty much standard, but there are little changes in the different designs. But they consist of a series of flat, thin, flat plates of metal in this case 316 stainless, that are separated from each other by rubber O-rings to create a container that will hold the liquid and then a large area up here to gather the gas before it's sent out. The way they're wired up is that the outer two plates are ground. These are the cathode. This is where the hydrogen is going to be made. And the center plate is the anode where the oxygen is going to be made. The plates in between are floating, electrically floating. If you imagine the center plate being positive, it's the anode, the inner surfaces of the plates on either side are at a negative potential relative to that center plate, and so they act as cathodes. But as the voltage drops down toward the cathode, the outside of those plates act as an anode relative to the plate outboard from them and so on and so on. And so because the plates themselves have virtually no resistance, they're big in diameter, they're very thin, and they're metal. All of the voltage drop that occurs between the anode and the cathode occurs in the segments of liquid between them. Now, if you fill that container with pure water and you create a potential here of at least 1.2 volts per segment, you'll begin to disassociate the water into hydrogen and oxygen. 
but you won't see any output. It will be vanishingly small. The problem is that once you create that potential, you create a, sh a layer of ions in front of each of the plates, and those ions cannot form neutral atoms unless you get the electrons to transfer between the ions, the hydroxides and the hydroniums, or the H+. Water is a horrible conductor of electricity. It's considered an electrical insulator. So you need some vehicle to complete the circuit and allow the electrons to move between the plates, and you accomplish that by adding a salt. Now, you could add almost any kind of salt. You could add sodium chloride, except chloride will produce chlorine gas in the output, so you want to stay away from table salt. Most commonly, you'll use sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide, and you can use it in a wide range of concentrations, all the way from about a twentieth of a mole all the way up to about half a mole. The only difference is, as you increase the salt concentration and get greater conductivity, you will produce more hydrogen and oxygen, but you will also use more current. It really doesn't change the efficiency. So once the gas has come out, it moves to what's called the bubbler. The bubbler serves three functions. One, it's a visual aid. You can sort of see the bubbles accumulating or moving through here, and you can see that it's producing some output. The other thing it does is acts as sort of a poor man's flashback arrester or one-way valve. If, for whatever reason, you got a spark that created a detonation or a flame tube, it could move into the volume of the gas here, but it isn't able to move all the way through and destroy the far more valuable and expensive HHO generator. And the third value is that it's a filter. Unlike this container, which contains the salt solution, the electrolyte solution, this contains pure water. So if this gets pretty vigorous and carries a mist of this corrosive salt mixture into this volume here, the water dilutes it so that what's coming out of the top isn't containing some corrosive material that's going to get into your engine. What we're going to do is I'm going to demonstrate the operation of this and we're going to measure the efficiency of the production of hydrogen and oxygen. So we're going to demonstrate the efficiency of the production by running the cell through a power meter that I've got located behind me here. And then we're going to time how long it takes to produce one liter of hydrogen-oxygen mixture. So in this basin of pure water, I have a one liter beaker that's inverted in the water. And I'm going to draw the water up, and then we're going to displace that with the hydrogen and oxygen. So we're going to use this sophisticated filling technique. Scientist always needs to have a broad tool set. All right, yum. Now I'm gonna put the bubbler down below here, like this, and a little counterweight just so that this thing doesn't float up and tip over and break. I'm gonna plug this in and we'll start the timer. And we're gonna be watching for the amount of power that this thing consumes when I turn this on. Ready to go? And we'll put this over to watts. Okay, so we're using about 386 watts. This will vary a little bit. And we'll see how long it takes to bring this all the way down to one liter. As the mixture gets warmer, you'll actually find that the electrolytic process improves. It doesn't get more efficient, it just draws more current and makes more hydrogen and oxygen. You see how this is starting to go up? We're getting close. There. 
Okay, so 50 seconds. And about 400, call it 400 watts. Good stuff. So 400 watts for 50 seconds is 20,000 joules. Thermal energy of hydrogen is 286,000 joules per mole. The mass of one mole of hydrogen is two grams. So the amount of thermal energy in one gram of hydrogen is 143,000 joules per gram. The density of hydrogen gas is 0.09 grams per liter. So the amount of thermal energy in one liter of hydrogen is 12,900 joules. And because we're making hydrogen and oxygen, H2O, two thirds of that liter is hydrogen, one third is oxygen. So the amount of thermal energy in two thirds of a liter of hydrogen is 8,600 joules. So we're generating about 45% conversion efficiency of the electricity that we used in order to generate that much thermal energy. That's probably typical of most commercial HHO cells. I'd like to show you just how much power though 8600 joules is when it's when it's producing the hydrogen and oxygen. And so I'm going to do a little demo here just for fun. Turn this on. Okay. And then we have some bubble juice. For you headphone users, here's a little warning. It's going to be loud. Pretty neat, huh? This stuff packs a punch. There's a lot of power there. All right, so to test the effect of the adding of the HHO, we have to get a baseline. What we're using here is a 79cc or 80cc Harbor Freight four-stroke engine. This engine has had its fuel tank disconnected, and I'm running this long fuel line over to a 100 milliliter burette. The box here is a modification of the input to the engine because a four-stroke engine is actually only inhaling vapor 25% of the time. But this is making hydrogen and oxygen 100% of the time. We don't want to waste that into the atmosphere. So what we've done is built a three liter box here that has a bunch of baffles and inputs over here. And then a little hose barb down near the input to the engine where the HHO is fed in. This allows the HHO to kind of build up between intake strokes so that we don't waste it. Now, because of the flow out of this HHO generator being about a liter a minute, and because this engine when operating at 3600 RPM is operating at 60 revolutions per second or 30 intake strokes per second. So 30 times 80 means that this thing's eating up about 2.4 liters per second or about 150 liters per second. So there is no way that one liter per minute is going to be countering the flow that's coming in through this box at about 150 liters per minute. That way we make sure all the HHO gets into the system. The, out the output from the engine drives this permanent magnet DC motor generator. These things are remarkably efficient. They're about 95% efficient. When you run them, they barely get warm. They're really neat generator systems. The problem though is they generate a three-phase AC output. And so we want to create DC. And so sending this through a three-phase rectifier will bring this to a DC current that travels through this line. But the current 
is very pulsatile. There's a huge amount of ripple coming out of the rectifier. So we send that into a capacitor bank that smooths out the power to produce smooth DC output that is fed into this meter here. This will read volts, amps, and then down in this corner right here, it will read watts. This is the number that we're really going to care about. The power from the meter then goes into a set of resistors. Each of these 200 watt resistors is wired in series with a partner, so it becomes 8 ohms. And then the series is run in parallel, so it goes back to 4 ohms. That turns out to be just about right for this system. Now when I run this thing, I'm going to start it up, like I said, it's going to be kind of loud, I'm giving you a little bit of a warning. And then we're going to measure how long it takes to use up 10 milliliters of fuel. Let's get started. I'm going to turn it on now. About 565 watts down there, right there. Now, we're going to wait till we get to 30 milliliters and then I'll hit the timer. I don't know if you can hear me over the motor, but that is an RPM gauge over there. It's not necessary for the test, but it gives us a little feedback on the engine. Okay, one minute, five seconds. About 570 watts. Ooh, okay. Should do this outside. Now we're going to send in the HHO and do the test all over again. I'm also going to run this for a little while into the engine just because we may have accumulated a little air in here. And to be fair, I want to make sure I flush out all the air and we're only running hydrogen. So while this fuel gets back down to a nice number, we're going to be wasting some HHO in here at the same time or some air and HHO mix. Hook that guy up there. All right, let's fuel this thing up to a better level. Another little interesting lab trick, if you're trying to do really precise measurements, relative measurements, sometimes even these things are poorly scribed. And so if you say, I want 10 milliliters, and you go between 30 and 40, you might get a different output if you go between 50 and 60. So really, when you're trying to get precise, try to redo everything as, as much as possible. All right. Start her up. So as you can see, we're running about 567, 570. We're about 540 watts on the electrical input. And we got almost the exact same amount of time running on the fuel.
This gets pretty warm. So I think we're busted. The amount of power that we needed to drive the electrolytic cell is almost equivalent to the power output of the engine. We didn't get really any increase in power and the amount of fuel that we used over the same period of time means that the total energy output from the engine is unchanged. So it's busted. These devices cannot work in theory. They don't work in practice. Save your money, don't purchase them. Hopefully you found this interesting. And for those of you that sell these or have used these, understand that you've probably been lied to by the marketers or you're lying to yourself. A lot of people who anecdotally say that they've found that this has improved the performance of their engines have probably modified their driving behavior simply because they want to believe that it'll work. And getting a little light on the throttle can make a significant difference in the mileage that you can get out of your car. I want to appreciate your spending the time and watching, and uh, if you really like the kind of stuff that we're doing here, please think about taking a couple of seconds and subscribing because it really helps the channel to grow. And the bigger we get, the more we can afford to show you. So I'd really appreciate it if you'd take the time to do that. In any case, I want to wish you a very pleasant afternoon. You take care, and we'll see you soon.